Hi, everyone. Welcome. So we're just going to give it a couple more minutes as people trickle in from all around. And then we'll get started. Oh, I like your word use, trickle in, speaking about beaver dams and the way that they <laughs> watch it. Nice. Yeah, it's very appropriate for talking about uh, beavers and watersheds. And uh, we're yeah, we're so excited to be diving into this topic. Um, yeah, I know many of you are joining in from classrooms. Um, so welcome. I hope your day is going well, that you had a good lunch break. Um, and uh, to everyone else, uh, yeah, we're so happy you're here too. All right, so we have an action-packed session, so I'm just gonna get started right away. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is David Quigg. Uh, I'm tuning in from the unceded territory of the Snunemuch in what is known as Nanaimo. Um, and we would love to know what territory you're joining in from. And there's a link in the chat in case you're unsure exactly what trad traditional territory that is. Uh, so please, yeah, put in the chat where you're from. We'd love to see that trickle in. Uh, and I'm deeply grateful to be here on this territory and bear witness to the gifts that these lands and waters have to offer. And I know that showing up in a good way is a daily reflection on my responsibilities and obligations to these lands and waters and to the people who have cared for them with great intention for tens of thousands of years. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, it's been a little while since our last Learn to Draw. We're so excited to have Julia's back. Uh, maybe you're joining us for the first time. If that's the case, welcome. Um, so welcome to all the students in classrooms here in BC, from other provinces, and to the hundreds of people uh, who are joining us from all around. Uh, so yeah, we're so grateful to have you all here with us. So why do we do these sessions? These Learn to Draw sessions are a way for us to build a stronger relationship with the web of life that we are all so deeply connected to. So it's thanks to, as you Many of you know, as you're studying in science or you, you know from being a human and alive on this planet, it is thanks to all creatures, big and small, that we have life and that we are able to breathe air and drink water and enjoy uh, being here in this miraculous thing called life together. Uh, so we are here to celebrate some of the beings who do, do amazing heavy lifting and bring amazing gifts uh, to the ecosystems. Um, so as you're here, as we're doing this work, I invite everyone to reflect on how we can act in better ways to our more than human relatives. I love that term, more than human. Uh, they are not lesser than, <laughs> they are more than human. We are all part of this wonderful ecosystem uh, and they bring us so many gifts. So how can we reciprocate? How can we give back to those beings and to the web of life uh, for all the many silent, countless beautiful gifts they're bringing us uh, every second, every millisecond of the day. Uh, and also, of course, how can we make sure we're living in balance with nature and that we're helping decision makers who make big decisions uh, on our behalf that affect uh, these creatures, big and small, and that affect our climate and our ecosystems. And we're seeing major impacts Today, we're gonna to be talking about drought, which is a huge climate-related impact. So we're gonna be thinking about how we can use art and what we're doing today to make a difference. So how can we use these, these pieces to really send a, send a clear message that ecosystems and the web of life are something we all deeply care about. So moving right along here, I would now like to welcome Julius, who many of you know from past Learn to Draw webinars. Dr. Julius Chitanyi is a natural history illustrator who has a PhD in microbiology. So I'd like you to think about that for a minute, the combination of not only being uh, one of the most brilliant illustrators uh, working today, but also having a PhD in microbiology. So we're so lucky to have Julius who can bring together the art world and the science world and make it all accessible to us. Uh, so Julius, we're so lucky to have you, so appreciative. Take it away. Thank you very much, David. Uh, it's a wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. 
it's always such an honor and a pleasure for me to be a part of these drawing webinars. I always have so much fun. And as everybody knows who's seen it before, I totally geek out on the on the on all the wonderful beings that we talk about. Um, so I'd like to also acknowledge that, like, see, I just moved recently <laughs> across provinces here. So um, I used to live in the, uh, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh territories, the unceded lands, which we also call Vancouver these days. And now I'm in an area which uh, in a city called Edmonton. But uh, I'd like to also acknowledge the the First Nations here, the uh, Nehiao, the Dene, the Anishin, sorry, Anishinaabe, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to uh, get these words, I hope I will not butcher the names too terribly, the Soti, uh, sorry, the Soto, the uh, Nakotaiska, uh, the Nato, the, sorry, the, the, the Nakotasu, uh, the Nitsitapi, um, and also the Métis. And so there's a wonderful diversity of people who have these cultures who have maintained such a beautiful connection with this land for thousands of years before uh, my ancestors from Europe came here. Um, and in this case, we are, I'm very honored to be able to uh, be on this land that has been so wonderfully cared for for thousands of years. I'm in a particular community here, which has recently been renamed uh, Wequintowin, which in Cree means circle of friends. Um, and so, with that, I'd love to get started on this. Uh, David, you provided a wonderful introduction to what really is at the core of my heart too, to uh, help us find balance with the other wonderful beings that live on this planet that we share this planet with. It's not our planet, it's all of our uh, planet. It's the most spectacular uh, phenomenon in life. This complex chemistry that happens that gives us this amazing interaction of, of living things is beautiful to me it, it powers me it's it's exciting and i'd love to do anything i can to help uh, support it and to reduce my impact on it that might be negative so one of the things that we love to do is, is learn and one of the things I, I love to encourage is for everybody to do as much as we can to experience this connection with life of everything from your backyard to the beautiful forests uh beyond the oceans uh, right now, we're going to look at streams and waterways as well and uh, what beavers do there and help us enormously. So with that, we're going to get started on how to draw North American beavers. So I'm going to start sharing my screen here. And then we'll see if we can get this um, loaded up properly. And here we are. And there it is. Okay, now, um, can you see that properly, David? Yeah, it's looking great. Can move this over a little bit so it's closer. It should work just fine. Just get my computer to. There we go. Hopefully it's okay. There we go. Good. It's all set up. All right. So I'm going to be. So you'll see me kind of. If you're looking at the the little headshot, I'm going to be going back and forth because I have a a tablet, a uh, digital tablet that I'm using to draw it on with this stylus. But you can use pen and paper, whatever works. Um, and I'm set this up to be about like a eight and a half by 11 inch page so that it fits most of them. Just pay attention to where you're going to be making the lines. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll call attention to that so that we have enough room to fit it. But what you see here is kind of a preview of what we're going to be going uh, to be making today. So this is going to be a beaver, a North American beaver, the two types of beaver alive today. Uh, they are the Eurasian beaver and the North American beaver. And the one we have here in North America natively is the North American beaver. Beavers originated in North America at the end of a time period called the Eocene, uh, many millions of years ago. And then a group spread to Eurasia and became a second species of beaver. But there were lots of other interesting beaver relatives in the past. The diversity was much higher. There used to be a giant beaver in North America, even right uh, I'm not sure about how far it spread onto the coast, but through most of North America, that would have stood about one and a half meters tall when it stood up on its haunches. So really, really interesting past diversity. But today we're going to be dealing with what is still the second largest rodent in the world. Rodents, right, are like mice, rats, squirrels. And then there's a giant one called the capybara uh, in South America. And of course, the beaver, the North American beaver, is the second largest of these rodents. So we're really lucky to be able to see this uh, in our in our backyard sometimes. I saw one crossing a street uh, where I lived in Vancouver actually last year. So I'm going to turn off the preview and we're going to get started drawing it in stages. So I'm going to um, keep this uh, as straightforward as possible and doing it in, in small sections of shapes. 
so that we can kind of uh, keep track of how we're doing this. So the first thing we're going to do, and I'm going to be talking, and then David also is going to be sharing in additional information. We're going to be kind of going back and forth about the biology, the conservation of this amazing animal that we call the beaver. So the first thing we're going to do here, we're going to start by making this kind of a uh, kind of a wonky shape. We're going to start with the animal's body, the sort of the back and the belly sort of thing, and then we'll add on bits. This kind of helps us to put it on the page somewhere. So I'm going to start by making, uh, make sure I get the right size, making a line starting near the sort of the top right side of the page. And it's kind of a, a curve, whoops, sorry, there we go, a curved line like this, that, kind of an arc, right? So a curved line. And then that's the very back of the animal. That's sort of, it's got a humped back, the way that it's it, it curves its spine, kind of hunched over. Uh, this actually helps animals uh, when, when they curve their spine, not like us who are standing up, but a lot of animals that walk on all fours, that curved spine helps them to reduce the amount of energy they need to hold themselves up. It's kind of a neat bit of the, their, their, their physics, actually. Then at the bottom here, at the back end, we have where the tail will emerge. And we'll talk about the importance of the beaver's tail shortly. But right now, we're just going to make this other little line that comes off like that. That's going to be where the tail will come off. And then the final part of this body right now is going to be the belly. And uh, the belly, in this case, will include the actual belly as well as where the legs will come off. And so we're going to put those in afterwards. But we're going to start with this kind of a slightly curved, almost like wiggly line that goes like this. So I didn't even know what we're going to call this shape. It's kind of like an open-sided lemon or something. I don't know. It's a beaver body. <laughs> So that's the first uh, step of, of drawing this beaver. But remember, and this is something I love to do as an artist. I like to sh show animals and plants from different angles. This is one from the side view. So it gives us a very straightforward view. But remember, you can draw them from any angle, any pose. It might be facing us. It might be walking away. Who knows? Swimming? It's other thing. Beavers are semi-aquatic mammals. They rely on the water as their environment for a large proportion of their life. That's unusual among mammals. Uh, and so this is a this is what gives it this incredible power uh, over its influence on the ecosystem in which it lives. And we'll learn fascinating things about that. OK, so the next thing that we're going to do is start adding the head of the beaver. OK, so now this will kind of complete the overall shape of the outline. Mostly this is going to be the top part of the head. So the back of the head and then the, the forehead and up to the snout and nose. This will be a line that will continue from the very first place where we put down our pencil, kind of make a little curved line forward to the right. And it kind of comes down a little bit. And there's a car corner right here and another corner here. So this is the, the back of the head, the top, the forehead, the snout, the nose area, and then down to the upper part of the jaw. Okay? This is not the chin yet. The chin we're going to add next. This is like the, the, the upper part of the snout. So that's the this beaver is just kind of sitting crunched crouched down and it's going to be in a posture standing on its back legs with its front legs up. Beavers have this amazing ability to use their front paws in a very dexterous way, very be able to manipulate things. They can carry wood or 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 food items. They can hold them. They can put their palms upward and carry things kind of like you might carry a heavy load in your hands. They're really amazing little animals that can walk on their hind legs alone for a while like that. So it's just really neat to see them actually do that. Now we're going to add the jaw or the chin of the beaver. And we're going to start from just below that second corner uh, under the snout and make this little curved line that comes like this. But not all the way connecting to the belly. So that's going to be because beavers have this very large lower jaw. And one of the things they have is these great big teeth. They have these massive incisors. Incisors are the, the two front teeth in our mouths, basically. Those um, uh, very flat teeth that we use to kind of nip at things initially. And so beavers have special teeth that always are growing. Ours come out and then they stop growing. Uh, we start with baby teeth, those fall out, and then the adult teeth come and then they stop growing and that's it. But beavers' teeth are always growing. And what they need to do is they need to be chewing on, on, on coarse, hard stuff like wood, like vegetation of different kinds in order to wear down the end of those teeth. Because otherwise, they'll grow too long and they'll actually start to pierce them out. So this is something that's evolved in them 
to be able to have teeth, even though they're eating these hard things, they never run out of tooth. So what we're going to do is show a little bit of the teeth. The first thing on this chin here, we're going to add the, the lips, basically, where the mouth is open. So if you look down at that jaw, we're going to add this little line like this. Kind of looks like it's got a big lips there. That's kind of the outer edge of, of the lip area where the fur stops and then the gums kind of begin. But inside there, we're going to see just barely the, the lower teeth, those lower incisors, uh, one of the pair, the lower pair that keeps on growing forever while the beaver is alive. So we're going to, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, actually, so that we see this better. And so I'm just going to bring it a little closer and reposition it. So centering it. So now we see what's happening here. We're going to draw this little line that's inside of the lips that goes like this and then put another line through the middle. What we see here are just the, the, the bottom bit of the two large lower incisor teeth. Uh, the beaver, beaver's mouth is mostly closed here, but it's still kind of hanging out a little bit. If you ever got a chance to look at beaver's teeth, um, hopefully not from too close up, we want to give them respect and not bother them, but you've seen videos maybe. Then you'll notice beavers have these really interesting yellow colored or orange teeth. You think, well, that must be really dirty or they need brushing their teeth. But in fact, it's not that. It's not dirt. It's the way it's supposed to be. It's actually interesting that the orange comes from iron-rich compounds that, that are part of the way their teeth grow. This helps to strengthen their teeth further. So you'll see a lot of rodents, including beavers, have these orange-colored teeth. So that's, that's what's going on there. Really interesting stuff. You can just see the, the lower incisors there. We'll also add uh, next uh other parts of the face so now we've got the head now we're going to add uh the ear that's on the right side of the animal the one facing us so the ears at the back of the head it's this kind of c shape kind of like this they look a little bit like our ears actually um and then there's a little bit of fur at the front end little ears they they don't really need giant ears so you look at animals on say the african savanna or on on our prairies a lot of those uh, herbivores, ones that eat plants, have these great big ears. And that's useful because they need really strong sense of hearing so that they can detect predators that might be coming close to try to eat them. Well, beavers actually have really good defenses that they don't have a lot of predators. They build these uh, wonderful lodges, they're called, uh, in the water, and they're really well protected from most predators. So it's not as big a deal for them to be able to run fast away from predators or hear them super well because they're well protected in other ways. So that's the ear on our side. The nose is next. The beaver's nose is kind of cool. Uh, they, the ears and the nose, actually, because these animals live in the water so much of their time, they swim a lot, they have these things, these valves, these little flaps that help their ears and their nostrils to close while they're underwater so they don't get water flowing inside. So they're actually protected while they're underwater so they can be underwater without getting their nose and their ears waterlogged. Kind of neat. So I'm going to add the nose here. It's kind of like a dog nose, actually, sort of similar looking. You have a little bit of this, this um, curved line here, and then there's a little C shape where the nostril is and it connects to the bottom, to the snout like that. So this area can make it darker. That's kind of, that's the nostril, right? And um, then down the center of the nose is this very, so like you, you can put like a dotted line. It's a little bit of a crease down the middle of the nose and then down also actually toward the, the mouth. It's kind of like you see, if you have a dog or a cat, you often see this little bit of a crease down the, the front of their nose and, and then their upper lip. So the beavers have something like that as well. Also notice that the, the nostrils are off to the side, kind of, not in the front. Well, this is really useful for an animal that's swimming so the water doesn't push into the nostrils, right? A little bit on the side, so it's away from the water flow a little bit. So they're so amazingly evolved uh, for the life that they lead, needing to be in water so much. It's wonderful to see this. I really enjoy it as a biologist, seeing all these things. Now we'll put the eyes in place. Uh, well, one eye, the one eye on our uh, that's visible on our side, on the right side of the beaver. So it's about halfway between the nose and the ear. And it's kind of yeah, shaped a little bit like a lemon. Uh, so it kind of comes like this. And it's not very big. Beavers don't have very good vision. You can make it dark black. And I would put a little light spot, leave a light spot at the top because the eyes are reflective. And we can. this is what we see in a lot of highly shiny surfaces. They reflect like 
the light of the sun, for example, is a little white spot. So this is something that we artists do a lot to indicate that it's a shiny, round, reflective surface, the eye. Uh, the neat thing that beavers also have is they have kind of a, a, a transparent eyelid so they can actually see underwater through it as well. Really, really amazing features for living underwater. So there we're starting to see the beaver's face appear looking more familiar like we see in beavers. They've got this really deep nose area or snout area. I'm going to zoom out a little bit now so that we see the whole beaver or well, what's starting to be the beaver here. We're going to add more to it now. The next thing is, uh, well, they have two ears and just a little bit of the one on the other side is visible from our point of view. It's just a little bump between the eye and the right ear that's just visible over the head like that. Of course, this will change how visible it is depending on which way its head is turned, right? If you're looking at a beaver from straight on, you'll see both ears and you'll see both eyes. You'll see the nose from the front. But it's important as an artist, if you're interested in, in developing your art, to keep in mind how different parts of an uh, animal will change in visibility depending on the angle that you're seeing it from. So it's kind of a fun thing that I love to play around with as an artist. So now we're going to start to add the feet. And the feet of beavers are really neat, as I kind of uh, mentioned already. Uh, the hind foot, the right hind foot is the one we're going to start with. This one is kind of neat because a lot of animals that live on land have separated toes. Well, kind of like we do, fingers and toes that are fully separated from each other. Beavers, on the other hand, do a lot of time in the water. And for that, really effective way to, to propel themselves underwater is to use paddles, right? Anybody who's been on a canoe or a kayak knows how great paddles are at, at, at getting us moving through water. Well, beavers have specialized hind feet that have webs between the toes, these webs of skin uh, that, that make the whole foot, including the end of the toes, one big paddle. And so we're going to draw this foot, first the outline of it. And this really helps them to be able to push themselves along underwater. So they have five toes on the hind feet. So I'm going to put one, two, three, four. And actually, there's a fifth one that you can't see that's on, on the, 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 the left side of this right foot. But there are five toes in total. Okay? And then there's the bottom of the foot heading toward the heel. And we're going to show that there's webbing, this skin between the toes by showing that the toes continue to kind of a little bit of a notch away from that you know, gap between the tips of the toes. And so what we have here is uh, it shows that the toes extend long, but there's this, this webbing of skin between them. That's what, when they spread wide, they become this big paddle that, that is able to push a lot of water at once. Talk hey, Julius, just yeah. to... Technical question for you. A couple of people in the chat are wondering what software you're using and oh, what yeah. pencil. Yeah, so uh, good question, actually. Um, I mostly use Photoshop for doing uh, my digital artwork. Uh, I love to do traditional artwork using an actual pencil or or paint brushes. I love acrylics, uh, all kinds of different kinds of watercolor. But for I'm a scientific illustrator, so I work with a lot of scientists and a lot of museums and book publishers. And I found that using this digital artwork is often helpful for me because it allows me to correct things more easily than than with uh, traditional artwork that involves an actual canvas or paper. Uh, and that actually helps me to work a little bit faster because in science, we often have to change things when new information is revealed. And so for that, it's nice for me to be able to change my drawing uh, more effectively, more easily. And this is why I rely on that. So Photoshop is common. I've used other ones like Corel Painter as well. And then other people use a whole lot of other kinds. There's many kinds out there now, actually. A lot of them are cheaper than other ones. So you, it's a good idea to look around. But it's it's a fun kind of a thing to do. Um, so now we have the hind foot, but I'm going to put little claws or little nails on top of the toes. They do have those, but they don't use them the same way that, let's say, a lion would use its claws or like a badger to, to dig as much. Beavers can dig, but on the hind feet, they're more paddles than diggers. So the claws are actually more on top than sticking out. These little claws that are sitting on top of the toes like that. There's our hind foot for the, the right side hind foot for the beaver. These are heavily propulsive paddles. They're very important for swimming. That's a big uh, role for them. Now we're going to add the front foot. In this case, very much a hand. They function like hands. As I mentioned before, they can carry things. They can carry uh, bit, uh, 
uh, branches of wood that they've chopped down with their really powerful uh, hard teeth. Uh, they can carry food items uh, to their lodge. So these are very effective. This one's hands are not going to be facing upward, but kind of downward in sort of a more neutral position. And so we're going to have to remember again that there are five fingers. These are not webbed. There's no skin between the toes here because it's more effective to use them uh, to, to grab objects when they're able to be separated. They're not the main swimming propulsive uh, 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 feet. So we're going to add five little fingers. One, two, three, four, and five little fingers. And so this hand and arm look really short, but there's a reason for that. Beavers have a lot of fur and a lot of fat on the outside. Oh, this beautiful little magpie just landed on my balcony. I love to see uh, wildlife right nearby. My goodness, it's checking out my plants. This is a, a sort of a magical moment. I love to see this. Okay, so there we go. So wildlife, we love to interact with wildlife to see them visit us. And it's just, to me, it's just a blessing to see this all the time. Anyway, so we have five little fingers. The arms look short here because all of this soft tissues, the skin and the fur and the fat underneath the, the skin of the beaver kind of help to smooth out its outline. In fact, the arms are tucked in a lot. So you won't see a lot of the arms separate, but we'll add those outlines later on. Okay, so that's the right hand. Very useful for carrying things. I've seen wonderful, adorable videos of beavers carrying large bunches of food, and it looks adorable. They use their tails to help balance them while they're walking on their hind legs alone. They're just amazing animals. Speaking of the tail, let's draw that. This is probably the most iconic, most familiar, recognizable portion of a beaver that anybody seeing a beaver says, aha, that's a beaver because of the tail. That's the one thing that really stands out among them. So the beaver's tail is this amazing paddle. Speaking of paddles, like from the, the, the hind legs, the beaver's tails are another especially well-evolved piece. So remember where at the very back end of the animal where we drew this kind of a flat end? We're going to start from there to draw this large paddle. And it looks like this. Down, and it's pretty big and very wide. Its tail in this drawing is sort of pointing downward and a little bit toward us. So you can see it a little bit from above. If you looked at it straight from the side, it's, it's kind of like if you hold your hand flat like this with your fingers together. That's sort of the shape of a beaver's tail. If you looked at it right from the edge, from the side, it would look very uh, narrow. But we're seeing it kind of tilted downward like this. And so you're actually seeing it sort of face on a bit. And so you can see this whole beautiful width of the tail. Uh, the, and you can also, see, we're gonna add a little bit of a line here coming out from the beaver's body at the very bottom of the tail that kind of disappears after a while. That's kind of like to show that it's thick, it's a thick tail. Hello, little magpie. Oh my goodness, it's checking out my plants still. This is beautiful. Um, okay, uh, I'm, I'm distracted by wildlife, but this is part of what we're doing here. This is just, just gets me so excited and, and, and just so filled with joy to see a wildlife like this. So the other thing, so the tail of the beaver, what does it do? There are several functions. I already mentioned that when they're walking on their hind feet, and not all animals have the ability to walk on just two legs like us. Beavers do. They can walk for a while on those hind legs. This tail is heavy, thick. It helps to counterbalance the, the front end of the beaver and whatever it's holding. So it can walk on two legs by balancing with its tail. That's one thing. Another thing it is, and it looks like a paddle, right? Well, it is. So beavers have the ability, they normally swim at moderate speeds, but they have the ability to just rock it off. And when they want to, they can use this tail as like a huge flipper, like a whale, and just powerfully push themselves off. And they can power away from danger through the water really fast. So it's an auxiliary motor, basically, in addition to their hind feet. And they can use it kind of like a whale uses its tail. Really powerful. The other thing they can do with it, um, if you've ever been in an area where there are beavers, you might have heard this slap sounds, loud slap. They use it as a, an alarm call to warn other beavers of danger. So they're at the surface, they're floating, their eyes and their ears and their nose are above the surface of the water. If you look at the shape of the head, they can observe danger. If there is like, there are some animals that go for them, like wolves or maybe cougars, some, some carnivores. They see them nearby, they take their tail and they're just slap it hard against the water. And that'll make this super loud noise that will be heard a long way around. This warns other beavers, uh, including its family, they live in a group, in a family group inside their lodge, to 
go for the lodge or to get away from danger. Uh, and then the lodge is their big protection. Very few animals can get into that lodge. Uh, and so they use this as a, an alarm call, a warning as well. So that's their 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 superpower, their tail. Uh, and in fact, uh, we have, when you look at the tail closely, they have this really interesting difference from the rest of the body. Most of the body is covered by fur, right? Not the lips uh, and not the hands, maybe, or the underside of the feet or the toes. But the tail also has skin, but it's not just any kind of skin. If you look closely at a beaver's tail, it's kind of really neat. Uh, it's got what look like fish scales on it. It's covered with skin, but these overlapping designs that look like fish scales. And so actually, if we were to look closely, we would see, I'm going to draw this on the side. You don't have to draw this, but it would look like this with a bunch of these scale-like markings that overlap. And it's this neatest thing. If you've ever looked at a fish of scales, they're like that. When you think about why that is in fish, scales are overlapping in a way that those round bits point backward because this makes them so beautifully slide through the water. You want as few things sticking out of, a, of anything that moves through the water quickly as possible. And any kind of little ridges should be pointing backward. That's what's happening with the beaver's tail too. These little scale-like things are arranged the same way that fish's uh, scales are. And it helps them to move through the water more easily. So beautifully adapted again for water. When you see them from the distance that we're viewing our beaver here, they are very small. And in fact, they kind of, you can, you can uh, depict them either by making individual scales, but more easily you can just make these patterns, these sort of crisscrosses that kind of look like that. So we're going to use that sort of technique to show the scales like texture on our beaver's tail. And we're going to start actually near the base of the tail by these little fine lines that it starts out sort of parallel to each other. But then as we go further back, you can actually turn them into these crisscrosses or what in art we call cross hatching. So some that way, some this way. And you see that they kind of generate these sort of diamond like shapes, which are very similar actually to the, the scale like pattern. So you can get away with that. In art, we often use sort of shortcuts in, in how we um, generate shapes, what shapes we draw to sort of kind of trick your brain into thinking that there's a certain pattern there that that it's maybe simplified, but it, it kind of makes a, a very similar pattern to it. So that's what we can kind of fill the beaver's tail with these kind of crisscrosses. And you know what? You don't have to make them equal uh, everywhere, not the same amount. So sometimes in art, we like to just kind of make patches like this that change a little bit from place to place. The reason I'm doing it this way, this sort of longer length of these uh, crisscrosses is because the beaver's tail actually has ridges on it. Uh, the beaver's uh, spine, the tail portion, actually goes into the tail and ends somewhere within the tail. So there's actually a bit of a bulge along the center of the tail, which is where the spine, the bones of the spine go. And so there's that bulge is what I'm representing by making this little bit of crisscrossing more towards the center. It's the side of that bulge. Okay? And then again, uh, on the edge of the tail to show a little bit of the thickness here. I'm going to put more of those crisscrosses along the edge here. Um, so it's kind of a, a way we use to, to show, uh, to use kind of textures and patterns on the surface to show curvature of the surface as well. This is bits that we learn in art and is very useful to apply in different ways. Okay, So we've got the tail, the powerful tail of the beaver. We're gonna start to add the the other hands and feet. Like it's got two of each, right? So we're just gonna draw this. While I draw this, I'm gonna say a couple of interesting things about the beaver that I found absolutely amazing to read about. Beavers, I'm gonna start with the hind foot and you can just kind of follow along, but I'm gonna talk as well while I do this. Beavers are a, a being that in ecology, and ecology is, one of my fields, it is what I studied is one of the things it is studying how animals and plants and other life forms interact with each other and with their environment in any ecosystem. And it's very important um, to learn these kinds of connections because this is how we learn how we should behave to avoid causing damage as well to the environments. Beavers interaction with other life forms and with their environment is spectacular. Beavers are really known for mother tail and also for what they do. They are called 
ecosystem engineers by some in, in science, and keystone species. A, what is a keystone? A keystone, if I'm going to draw this on the side, you don't have to draw it. In ancient, I believe it was Greece, they, they made archways and doorways, right? So what they would do is stack a pile of rocks together or stones that have been cut into rectangles like this, like the sides of the doorway. And then what to do above, above the top? If you were just to stack stones side by side, the middle ones would just fall down. So they came up with this ingenious bit where they would stack a series of stones that were cut so that their edges were sort of curved. And they would stack them together like this. What's really neat is that when you do that, because of the shape of these stones, they support each other and none of them falls out. This stone at the very top here is super important. It's the one that keeps all the other ones from falling. It is called the keystone. Uh, and its role is to keep the entire structure from collapsing. In ecology, in studying these animals and plants interactions, we refer to keystone species, animals or beings or plants, beings of life that function to in a very large way to keep an ecosystem from collapsing. They have an important and exceptionally important role compared to a lot of other types of life forms. And beavers are keystone species in wetlands, areas that have a lot of standing water that support hugely diverse life from aquatic insects to fish, waterfowl, all sorts of animals that rely on the water on the shorelines, plants that live along the shorelines that need more water than normal. Beavers, because they build these structures, uh, these dams, which are huge piles, very carefully, piled pieces of wood because they can cut down wood with their teeth. They arrange them in these dams, these lengths, these long piles of wood to, to basically um, pile up the water, literally, behind it. They'll take, they'll look at a stream, they'll find a stream and they say, okay, well, well, they don't say, but they look at it and they figure that they can pile this uh, these, this wood along the stream, and that helps to, to pile up the water behind it. It stops it from flowing until it can overtop the dam. And suddenly you have this deeper water. And because the stream now is piled up higher than it was before, it spreads out wider. And so studies have shown that in areas where beavers are, they increase the extent of these wetlands by over one and a half times what they are without the beavers. They increase the depth of the water. They increase how long the water stays in place without evaporating, especially during droughts. Super important these days. And they increase the diversity, the total number of different kinds of beings that live around there by about a third in many cases, which is important because they increase the complexity of the landscape, how patchy it is from one place to another. The beaver dams can be anywhere from about a few centimeters to over three meters tall. So imagine they can take uh, a small stream and convert it to a pond and larger stream that is over three meters deep. Suddenly fish like salmon can use this uh, that didn't weren't able to before. The logs and the these branches that they put together can be anywhere from about a few meters wide or long to hundreds of meters long. A dam can entirely create an effectively a whole new lake, a whole new ecosystem. I'm going to keep drawing here. I, I love talking about this because it is absolutely spectacular. And while, while I do this, uh, David, um, can you say some things about why it's so important for this work that beavers do, especially these days for us, uh, in terms of the effect on water in these ecosystems? Yeah, thank you so much, Julius. Um, just to jump on the last point you're saying about dams. So some beaver dams are so big, they can actually be seen from space. <laughs> uh, they, they're in some in Canada specifically. Uh, they, so they talk about a, a, an animal that bats above its weight. Uh, for those of you that like uh, uh, baseball, uh, they, they are truly remarkable, truly ecosystem engineers, and they can change the landscape and, and they change it in beneficial ways for all life. They're kind of superheroes for, well, sorry, for all the wildlife around them. So when we're thinking about a place like uh, British Columbia or Alberta or the rest of Canada, really anywhere, um, when we increase 
the water, surface water and depth of that water, it's like sending a beacon out to all of nature saying, hey guys, <laughs> we got life here because all the little microbes gather in the water and all the tadpoles and, and microorganisms that are food for slightly bigger creatures that are food for slightly bigger creatures just create this symphony of life all around these beaver ponds. And so what happened in the history of this continent is, is quite tragic, as and I think many of you have learned this, that uh, Europeans came over um, with the, the hundreds of years ago with an objective to use beaver pelts for hats. I mean, it's kind of kind of bizarre to think about it, but there was this big fashion trend going on in uh, in England and other countries uh, for top hats made out of beaver pelts. And so at certain points, at the height of the, uh, of the beaver uh, trade, over 200,000 beavers were being killed uh, per year. So this had a huge impact on local ecosystems. Um, and the, the, where we're at now with climate change, um, which can also be called as, you know, a climate crisis, of course, uh, what we're noticing here in BC is that each summer is getting much, much drier. And although we've had a bit of rain lately and we're celebrating and welcoming that rain, some people are even complaining about it, but I say to them, well, listen, <laughs> the bigger picture is that we are having such dryness uh, hitting our our this part of the continent. Uh, and so we are really extra dependent on these heavy lifters like beavers uh, to help retain the water in the ecosystem. Uh, so it doesn't just rush down the hill. And I'm going to tie it a bit to logging, and then I'll let Julius jump back in. But, you know, when practices like clear-cut logging, all, what they do is erase so many huge patches of the landscape that would otherwise be sponges for water, that would otherwise hold that water for so, so long and have it cycle and, and trickle gradually into the streams. So what happens uh, after a clear cut, when it rains heavily, is that water rushes down into the river, pulls down all the sediment, causes flooding that can rush into communities and sometimes wipe out lots of homes, as we've seen in Merritt and, and we saw in the Fraser Valley. And so what beavers do naturally in their engineering is retain that water up slope. So we need to be so send such a strong message to our decision makers and the people we talk to about the importance of beavers uh, and the role they play in keeping us safe, uh, preventing flooding and ensuring that water is available as we want to water our fields uh, for, for food. So we rely on them for our food and for our, uh, you know, our, our safety during climate impacts. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Julius. Thank you, David. That That is exactly it. I mean, the beavers are as you said they're they're superheroes they with these dams that they create they allow water to slowly trickle through as opposed to all of it as you see rushing out um wiping out a lot of of, of the the life that that would otherwise hold soil in place uh and so they're it's actually been found that that the water is is retained and allowed to trickle much more efficiently than our, our own concrete built dams these are really superheroes, beavers, just amazing engineers. And um, so the other thing that these dams do is they filter the water. So they, they fill the, the space between the branches with grass. And all of this collects a lot of the mud and other kinds of things that would otherwise make the water muddy. It clears the water. It also filters out pollutants. And so this is, makes a much healthier environment for fish. So we've found that on the West Coast, there's been a massive crisis and the drop or collapse of the population of a lot of salmon species that are crucial for every ecosystem and also for our own food and for, you know, out in the ocean, food for orcas as well, for example, and many other species. So everything is connected. Beavers help to make more healthy environments for young fish of these types to grow up for environments that are less likely to evaporate during these droughts that we're experiencing and therefore keeping these young fish alive so that they can become another generation of fish. Again, that's another way that, way that they help. And one of the problems we're seeing, and you know, hopefully we, we see less of it this year, and I'm really, really grateful for all the water, the rain that we're getting, is that there are wildfires increasing in frequency and severity. They're getting more powerful, more destructive year by year. 
This is extremely well supported and it's, it's tragic to see. People are losing their homes by thousands. Animals and plants are losing their lives, their homes. Um, I recently got a uh, newsletter from Nature Canada talking about how uh, migratory bird species are heavily impacted by these fires. Some of them lose their lives. Uh, nests, chicks are, are killed in the wildfires. Enormous numbers of, of, of animals and plants die in these. Beavers, by creating deeper, larger sources of water, prevent all of that water from evaporating as quickly during droughts. And these are important sources of water to keep animals and plants alive especially around their edges and have actually been shown to reduce the chance of a lot of these ecosystems uh, to succumb to fire. So they are truly superheroes that are saving our landscape. And it's sad that they nearly were wiped out um, hundreds of years ago or, or even several decades ago. But what's amazing is that they've really rebounded. So here's another thing to keep in mind. There's reason for hope. It can be tragic to see what's happening out there, and it is heavy on many of our hearts, uh, and it should be, I think. But keep in mind, don't let despair take over because there is, in fact, reason for hope. Beavers are a wonderful example of that. Yeah, they've decreased to almost being wiped out. In, in Eurasia, the, the Eurasian beaver decreased to a number of only about 1,200 individuals, which was almost gone. Beavers in North America have rebounded to populations of uh, 6 to 12 million already. And uh, even then, that's a low population. Originally, their populations before we started hunting them were probably between 60 and 400 million beavers. So there's a long way to go. But imagine how much of a difference it is now that we have several million already present. And so now we have the joy of being able to see a beaver lodge and beaver dams across our, our landscape where they wouldn't have been visible otherwise. And now we have a healthier ecosystem. I'm going to finish this drawing. I filled in a lot of the fur details by adding a little bit of a, a, a quick drawing of uh, the, oopsie, sorry, I took out the wrong one, <laughs> of the uh, the beaver dam that this guy is standing on. So this one's uh, produced a dam. So you can actually draw a crisscross of all kinds of branches under it. It's a kind of a representation of the dam. It's sloping down toward us. A bunch of branches tangled together. Beavers can carry these branches in their hands after gnawing down these trees. Oh, by the way, you think, well, maybe they're destroying a lot of habitat by chewing down these trees. But you know what? Um, in ecology, again, we find that having a more patchy environment where there's some gaps in the canopy of trees, some, some gaps in tree forest cover here and there spread apart, is actually helpful because it allows for the forest to regenerate, to, to grow a lot of new trees. And one reason why that's really important is you get forests of different ages altogether. Why that's important is that that makes it less likely for forest fires, for example, to take out an entire forest that's the same size and spread really quickly. And also insect pests. Insect pests um, can ravage forests. And we see that a lot these days when they have what are called um, the monocultures of tree plantations after clear-cut logging, that all the trees are the same size and same age. And suddenly they're, they're, they're susceptible to pass so much more when they are all the same. Reduces the diversity of life too. When you have all the trees the same age, we need this patchiness in the environment to increase the health of the environment, to resist disease, fire, uh, to increase the number of uh, types of beings that live together that makes for a healthier ecosystem. So beavers, by kind of selectively removing patches of forest, actually help to overall increase the health and diversity of these forests and the, the, um, the plants surrounding these water bodies that they create by damming them up. So again, superheroes and ecosystem engineers that are, are absolutely spectacular. So I'm just adding a bunch of branches. And at the very bottom of this, we can add the lower level of water just by kind of a few lines parallel like this to show where the water level is at a lower level. And then at the very top of the beaver dam, underneath the beaver, uh, we can, where it ends here, we can draw these, again, parallel lines sideways showing the upper level of water. This is a higher level because it's been held back by the beaver dam, which is a whole big collection of branches and grass put together. And maybe even behind we can see this um, 
kind of a, a, a stump that the beaver has chewed uh, and they have this characteristic kind of like a sharpened pencil like point almost uh, showing where their teeth have kind of gnawed it to a sharp point. And that's how they felled the tree. They're pretty amazing. They actually cut down entire trees and the, the tooth marks are visible as these little uh, scalloped marks along the part of the tree that's been sharpened by them. It's really neat. Oh, by the way, by increasing the level of water uh, in these these ponds and, and almost lakes that they produce, as David mentioned, or some of them are visible from, from satellites, they actually, some of the, the trees that are suddenly flooded will die. But again, hang on, it's not just destruction. These trees, these standing snags, they're called, they're dead sort of standing logs, are now habitat for woodpeckers, which can more easily carve out uh, holes in them in this, this dead wood. And so now you have habitat for a whole other group of birds as well. So one of the things we, we hear is that logging, clear cutting is helpful because it removes all the dead stuff. Well, that's actually not good biologically. We want the dead logs to stay in place. Dead logs function as nurse logs to uh, support other new trees to grow from them. They protect them uh, from various kinds of threats. They serve as sources of nutrients. Uh, they collect all kinds of uh, nutrients. They uh, release nutrients when bacteria and fungi, mushrooms, and so on break them down. This is all food for regenerating a forest. If you remove that, the forest is now basically starving and it's harder for it to regenerate. So beavers create a lot of this dead stuff and that actually helps by increasing the nutrient content of this forest, regenerating some of it in a dynamic cycle, not removing it all at once, much healthier. So there we go. There's our beaver. Uh, there's the dam that it has so uh, labor to produce. Uh, and of course, you can even put like a beaver lodge, which is a big dome of these pile of branches. And that is hollow inside that the beaver can access from a hole underneath. Really cool. Uh, that's where they live. Uh, it's a family group of like about maybe four to six beavers, uh, a, a mother and then a lot of their, their babies, which are called kits. Uh, Julius, uh, we have a question in the chat. Is this a male or a female Beaver, and is there a way to easily tell? Good question. So there's a little bit of a size difference between them. They, males and females look a lot similar to each other. Um, I would be really bad at telling them apart. Uh, this could be either of them, I think. Uh, now, if anybody actually knows this better than me, I'm open to, I'm happy to, uh, to, to hear about this. But I do know there's a little bit of a size difference between them. But other than that, they look really similar to each other, males and females. So you could actually pretty much say it's either way. Uh, there are no... Um, structures on them that that more obviously show them as 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 male or female um, uh, visible from the outside. So they could pass as either. Of course, younger ones are smaller too. So you kind of have to look at them carefully to determine what they are. But this could be a mother beaver that has uh, you know done a great job of, of of creating this dam to create new habitat for herself. And in doing that, she helps create habitat for everybody else. Um, the, the the young will start to um, separate to go to new places after a couple of years. Female beavers will start to produce litters of up to nine babies after about three years old. And they can live up to about 10 years or more, uh, sometimes up to 20 or more years in the wild. And so they actually have a long time to alter the environment to create these beautiful wetlands. Um, so, yeah, there we go. And so what... I'm just going to jump in, if I can, to talk about what I mentioned earlier about how we can use this art to influence decision makers to stand up for magnificent creatures, keystone species like beavers that do so much heavy lifting for all of us. Um, so, you know, members of parliament or the legislature or even city councillors, they get a lot of letters, a lot of emails, and often it's this boring waterfall of just the same old text <laughs> they're not too exciting but if they receive artwork and if for example a classroom submits uh you know a collection of the classroom's artwork with a message on the back or a, a message on behalf of the class of saying we are learning about just how incredible beavers are or this or that species um and we want to make sure that they're protected and so you could ask to the decision makers, what are you doing to make sure that that these animals that bring us so many gifts that are helping us in so many ways are protected from 
uh, people that want to, you know, develop that habitat or cut down that forest, whatever it is. Um, so we need stronger laws. And these people in government are lawmakers. They make these laws. So they need to hear from you. They won't do it by themselves. They need a lot of a lot of push, and a lot of pressure. And there's nothing better than artwork, uh, than youth voices coming in and saying, hey, we, we're, we're the ones that are going to be uh, dealing with the mess that you're creating. Uh, let's protect the, the beings that are really helping us out. Um, so, and you know, this yeah. is wonderful. And in case, in case, you know, there's, there's sometimes you feel like despair, like, oh, well, what difference can I make with a letter? You know, in, in our community um, where I lived uh, in Vancouver, we used to have a, a group of people that would meet with our local MLA periodically to see what progress was being made uh, to protect uh, forests and other parts of the environment. This was actually very helpful. And he, our MLA told us, because we asked, he said, don't stop doing this. Don't stop writing letters, uh, meeting, uh, you know, doing protests and so on. Show members of government that this is important to you. He says that is what they need to be able to see that this is important so they can move on it. He strongly encouraged us, please keep doing this because that's what he needs and they need and she need to be able to have to show other members to say, see, look, my constituents are really find this really important. I, I feel responsibility to push for this, to help make responsible laws that protect these things that they find very important. So we want to do that. We, we're encouraged by them to do this because it makes a difference. I've been involved in letter writing campaigns that have made enormous differences. And I celebrate when I see that. And it does work as much as we're sometimes uh, feel that no, it doesn't. It really, really does. So please do that. Uh, wonderful class projects, as Dave mentioned. I, I think it's just exciting. So, oh, and um, did you want to mention, uh, are we able to do any galleries uh, for emails, uh, sending in uh, pictures of some, that some people might send in? I'm not sure. We've done that in the past with Sierra Club. Yeah, please, please take pictures of, of your artwork or of your teachers, of your students' artwork, and share it to the email that uh, my colleagues are going to pop into the chat. And we would love to be able to share and feature all this beautiful artwork that you're uh, you're creating. Um, and, and Julius, can I, is it a good time to mention upcoming uh, Learn to Draws? Absolutely. Yeah, so we have, uh, we're so grateful to have Julia's back after a bit of a pause. Um, it, we don't have anything planned in July yet, but in August, in collaboration with UBC for a, a conference called Communicating Climate Hope. So this is obviously a very important topic conference. Julius is going to be leading a web, an online version, you can tune in from anywhere, all on humpback whales and the success story of humpback whales. Very good news. So that's August 14th. I'll, we'll be sharing some emails about that with invitations. Uh, then we have September uh, towards the end of the month, September 25th on migratory birds, uh, October 29th, the salmon shark, and November 22nd, wait for it, wolverines. Uh, so you're not going to want to miss that. Um, so we, we'd love to have you back uh, to extend this conversation. Um, Julius, did, did you want to say anything else before we wrap up? That's, I see a couple of participants have raised their hand. I don't know if we have any other questions before, if we have time for questions. Um, if not, then I would really love to thank everybody for participating in this. And, and I'll, I'll leave it to you, David. Yeah, thanks so much. So I'll just go through the chat here quickly. Thanks for sticking around. I know teachers are on very tight time schedules. I was a teacher myself. Uh, so yeah, we have... Um, yeah, there we have the social at sierraclub.bc.ca. Please send your artwork into that address. Also, please send it to your politicians. Uh, please, wonderful. Be such an amazing thing to do. Uh, we have lots of thank yous in the chat. And a big thank you to everybody who participated. This has yeah. been so much fun. Uh, for myself, I love doing this. Uh, David's been wonderful at, at, at keeping this wonderful conversation going between us. And all of the learning from this, that what we can transmit here, it is just so rewarding for us to be able to do this because we care so much about these these wild spaces that if we can, anything you can do to inspire your friends, family, uh, to show them uh, how beautiful it is out there, I think that's the key, really. Yeah. Uh, th thanks so much. Well, uh, sorry, I'm trying to draw some questions from the chat, but it keeps moving. So 
please have a look at the chat because my colleague is answering many of those questions as we go. Uh, but I just want to extend a huge, huge thank you to Julius uh, for sharing your enormous gifts with us. And I think that's really what this is all about, is appreciating the gifts of all of us. We're learning about the gifts of the beaver and, and we're learning ways we can reciprocate and give back to these amazing beings. So check in, like I said at the beginning, with what gifts can you offer the, the beautiful web of life that you're a part of uh, to make sure that we're all doing well for generations and generations to come. Here, here. So a big thank you on behalf of Sierra Club, Julius, and thank you all, everyone who joined us here today. Thank you.